apples and trees The world's a perfect design Do it all so well and you know it Let your light shine and know you show it Mercy, joy and success Every day is a chance for Hello and welcome to The Great Song Adventure. We're here for episode two with uh, great songwriter Carol King, who's also your mom. Great to get to, to be with the two of you together. So we, we did one interview and she had so much to say and we had a lot of questions and we had just a wonderful conversation that, that it became very expansive. So we have five episodes. So this is the second of five today. Yeah, it was really expansive. And what I loved about it is I'm able to share the side to her that I so often enjoy to talk about the creative process. And I think she's always been reticent about interviews, but she loves having conversations, Mm -hmm. you know, and she and I both, we're both fairly intellectual. (laughs) We Mm -hmm. like talking about ideas and the creative process and, you know, we have fun and sometimes we'll go to the piano and show each other different things. But she brought all of that into these interviews. And so it's a real rare opportunity to hear the things she was thinking about when she was writing those songs and what they were influenced by and, you know, Mm -hmm. what they were doing when they were really just kids. Yeah. I didn't really realize how young she was when she started. She was 17 or so when she started bringing her songs to people and even you know before she met your dad she was she was already doing that yeah she said she went to don costas when she was 15 okay, and 15. you know she somehow got in the door the secretary didn't kick her out and he saw something in her yeah she did say that yeah and uh, it's great too to get to to learn the stories behind famous songs but also to correct the record cuz so much that we learn about people is is just wrong or distorted and there were two issues that i thought one which I have been saying myself for years because I heard that it was true. And the true part was that she and Paul Simon, uh, at, they met at Queens College, uh, made demos together and uh, under the name The Cousins. And I knew that, that they made demos, but I'd always heard that Paul played guitar and uh, bass. They both sang and Carol sang and uh, played piano and also drums. And I remember thinking, boy, she plays drums too. I mean, isn't she great enough? And then she, she just laughed when I mentioned that. She said, no, I never played drums. So it was good to correct that record because that was completely wrong. Though they did make demos together. The other part is uh, I read, and I think uh, a lot of things that that are written about her says she had perfect pitch or absolute pitch, and that her father, you know, loved that so much that he would show her off that she had perfect pitch, and she corrected the record and she said no, she has relative pitch, which is different. A lot of people who are music- musicians don't get the distinction, but perfect pitch means you can just sing any note without a piano that you know what the notes are relative pitches after you already kind of know where you are, that you can hear other things relative to that. So she corrected that record too. And it's good to get the record straight. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes people don't want to correct the record if the record makes them be more exceptional in their superpowers than, you know, they even are. Right. Well, that says a lot about her that she's a very humble person. I mean, she said at one point that, you know, I don't know why it was us and not other people that, you know, whose songs became so famous And I said then, I think it's because you were better than a lot of other people, that the songs are just great. And she has a a tremendous talent, but she's very humble, so she doesn't attribute any very much very much to that at all. Well, I will say to our listeners, listen and learn, because there is a reason why the songs were better. There was definitely gifts and talent that both my mother and father had and it got even greater when they were together and it got even greater in the environment and times they were doing this in. But there is a real work ethic. There is a process of taking things to the next level and reaching and having a level of focus and drive that she says over a period of time made her better year after year. And if Mm -hmm. you remember, you know, by the time she was making solo records and Tapestry was not her first solo record, it was 
it was in her mind her third mm -hmm. when she came out to California. She had already been writing songs for 10 years. You know, she said, why was it us? If you love it and you're passionate, you keep getting better. So Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely part of it. They had a real joy and love, as she said, of the doing. They, they, they loved it, and that's injected into the songs. You can feel that in their early rock and roll songs like Locomotion through her later songs. You've got a friend. It's, it's genuine. You can tell those are real songs, and you can't fake that. And they had a lot of drive, and Jerry said that too when I interviewed him, your dad, that they wrote a lot of bad songs, what he considered for years. And that's something people don't get, that it takes a while to develop artistry, to do it and really learn about songwriting. And uh, she talked about that too. So absolutely, it's, it's a combination of all those drive, love for songwriting, but real great talent too. And I think they were very focused on impressing other people who were close to them. You mm. know, it was either Donnie Kirshner or they wanted to write a more impressive song than Barry and Cynthia and get the cut. Or sometimes, even later, she had talked about how she just wanted to play something for Danny Korchmar and Charlie Larky, who she was in a band with, and say, hey, check out my new song. Yeah, There's, there's a lot to be said for having that pride of playing it for someone close to you and being yeah. proud of it. Yeah, and I think even between the two of them, your mom and your dad, they had that. Because uh, he wanted to impress her, like, look at these lyrics I wrote for your melody or, and vice versa like Lennon and McCartney. And I thought it was interesting that your mom brought up Lennon, that he was kind of like Jerry and that Paul was more like her. And they had to deal with this kind of troubled genius in some way, but it was worth it because the guy was a genius and it was a similar uh, dynamic and that they were, they were trying to, they were impressed by each other and trying to uh, make an impression as well. I will say in later years, when I went to visit my father for any occasion, one of the first things we would do is go sit in his office and he would want to hear any new songs I was working on and mm. play me new songs he was working on. I mean, that he lived to be able to say, hey, you want to hear a song I just wrote? It was really a, a source of bonding between us. He loved that feeling of being able to share and, and he had a lot of pride and listen to what I just wrote. I love when you imitate him too. You and your mom both do that. In the, in the, it's yeah. great. We bring them back in the room when we do that. So let's listen. This is part two of part five with Carol King. While we're on the subject of songs, you were over at my house when I had come off a tour where I had passed the New Jersey house and I stopped and the owner of the house let me in and I took all these pictures and you were so moved by seeing pictures of Waddington Avenue with the doorbell still playing Will You Love Me Tomorrow. Offbeat. Did you play offbeat? It always did. It was always so funny. It, it went... Bang, 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 bang. It was like, we were so nouveau something, you know. We had a doorbell made. Yeah, but apparently so you were the one who changed the little switches in it and said, oh, all the right notes are in here. I just have to move the order of them. Oh, did I change it? You told me that. Okay. You said, I must have then, but I not even hear it in later years, but they still had it. They still had the doorbell, but my point is, is that when you were looking at those photos in my kitchen, I started asking you about what songs you had written in that house, and you, you, I think you said I wasn't born to follow, you had a point of no return, you know, I wasn't born to follow, for sure. How did, wasn't born to follow, how did that start was that a title oh, first it's a hard song for me to talk about Is because it? that was um the second of the uh women that jerry got involved with in on marriage and he was writing that about me i wasn't born to follow meaning me she may beg and she may plead and she may argue with her logic mention all the things i'll lose that really have no meaning though i doubt that i will ever come to understand their meaning in the end I'll, she'll surely know I wasn't born to follow. He was talking about me. So it's a but I line. love a good song. <laughs> I love a good lyric. And so I wrote it and I, it, it, it was, I, I have no regrets of writing it. And I set aside, I compartmentalized the pain in service of a good song. So you understood that was, was it a message Which, to by you? the way, I did about the musical Beautiful. Because I've seen it now about seven times, but when I first went to see, you know, they were working on it, and I was like, I don't know if I ever want this to be made. And the first act ends with when Jerry tells me about the first woman he was wanting to see, 
And after that, I went to a workshop and saw this and I got up and I told Sherry, who's one of the producers, I said, you know what? I can't go ever go see this show. It's too painful. But with my professional hat, the one that wrote the song, I wasn't born to follow. I said, this is really good. I think you should go ahead and do it, but I will never go see it. So I have that ability, apparently, to compartmentalize in service to write a of good a song. good piece of work. Well, when you were writing that, was, was, was did he write it as a message to you? Was he... I have no idea <laughs> what it was. I think he, it was just what he was feeling at the time, and it was a lyric. I don't think he pointedly gave me the lyric to say, here's what I'm thinking. <laughs> I think he gave me the lyric because we needed a, lyric, a song for somebody or other. I have no idea. I mean, I think the birds recorded it eventually, but I don't think we wrote it for the birds. What happened with Going Back? What was, where was that written? Waddington That's, Avenue, definitely. That's Same New period. Jersey when you say Waddington Avenue. That's New Jersey, yes. Yeah. West yeah. Orange, New Jersey. West Orange, I know West Orange. So it, uh, Pleasant Valley. Uh, yeah, There's a Pleasant yeah. Valley way. I was going to say, we well, you know oh. Pleasant Valley said they had to be written. And what about the Porpoise song? That was written there, too. Um, and that was for the movie Head. Right, yeah. Which was, I love that song. I love I that, loved song, that too. song when we wrote it. Jerry was so out there, but he was where he needed to Did be. Did he produce it? He produced the demo. Did he? Oh, wait a minute. He might have... No, the, the monkeys. I don't think he produced the monkeys, but I could be wrong because at that point I don't know where we were in our marriage. I have monkeys. But he's definitely produced the demo. I have friends. That's all they want me to ask you about is the songs about the monkeys. There's some people. That's all they care about. Hey, the monkeys. That's another. You know, underrated at the time, have stood the test of time. Yeah. Really good, and they were a manufactured group. Donnie Kirshner said, "You, you, you, and you." You're a group, but one of, part of the reason that they're so, um, you know, so good was they had great songwriters. I mean, we were certainly not the only one. The last Train to Clarksville, Barry and Cynthia. I mean, all, all yeah, I'm a Tommy believer. Boyce no, and Bob. Boyce and Hart. Boyce yeah. and Hart wrote Last Train, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, they had great songwriters at help. Yeah. Right? But they sang well, too. Huh? They sang well, and Nesmith was really talented. Mike Nesmith was really... He's still around, isn't he? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, he is. So uh, let me say Mike Nesmith is really talented. <laughs> I remember when we first came to L.A., we'd go to Screen Gems, go to the IHOP across the street, <laughs> and you'd see Boyce and Hart in there getting waffles and pancakes. <laughs> and that was... and we. I remember as a kid seeing Davy Jones at Screen Gems there too one time. Now that would be a big deal. Too. It was a huge deal if you Davey were a little Jones. girl. I remember. It's I, all the girls cared about. Yeah, <laughs> and nobody believed me when I told them, you know, later. But anyway, yeah. So, so you wrote those songs there, and I mean, I remember I, I, sitting in the kitchen, and you said you wrote all those songs, and I guess when you won the Gershwin Prize. It was just before the musical, and I thought, beautiful, it's simple, I could learn this song. As soon as I sat down and played it, I realized it wasn't simple. It's not simple. It's like a Gershwin song. It, it has is. all these changes and key changes. And it's good it's, to learn that stuff. It's, it's an education to play your stuff. It's ornate. Well, I, and I've had my share of that, which brings me back to James Taylor. When I was on tour with him in 2010, um, I had to learn the piano parts to some of his songs. Um, several of them were, I mean, they're, they're sad. They sound so simple and they're so complicated. And the one that just really blew me away every time is the secret of life. Oh, that's beautiful. It sounds, you know, really simple. And, and I, these changes and the way he goes, he uses chords too. Yes. And bass lines. Adult chords. Like that. Yeah. Adult <laughs> chords. And he is, you know, just as with me, my, the bass is like the bass that I play when I'm playing my songs is what the bass player basically should play. And he is the same with, you know, his, his thumb. I'm amazed that anything would seem complex to you because your own songs seem complex. And but not to song. me when I'm creating them, and that's that's it. But I get the concept that you had trouble with beautiful because for me it was easy. It came out of me. Well, yeah, I, that happens in my writing too where things are very complex, but if you're the writer, right. seems, you know what's right. happening, but it doesn't make sense. It's not intuitive for someone else to learn. Yeah, Beautiful exactly. is cool. It was interesting you said you love listening to R&B because so many of your songs are really rhythmic and soulful. And 
Well, you said no intro. You know, back in the day, there were intros. You know, my tears are falling because oh, you've taken intro. her away. And that was a, a thing that was used when Jer in Jerry's formative years and what he was listening to in show, Broadway show music. Yeah. So you mentioned intros. and I know, meant a musical intro. Like, you just start with the, the vocal, right? You got to, you know, there's, yeah, there's no introduction yeah, at right. all, right? Well, but there's that's a chord. A chord. Um, you yeah. got to. You know, you were mentioning playing with James. And, you know, I saw you when you did started the Troubadour thing at the Troubadour. And the thing that... The original Troubadour? Troubadour the tour. When you, yeah, oh, when you yeah, played at yeah. the Troubadour. I didn't get to see you the first time. But, and you were a great piano player. But you were so in sync with his guitar. It was just perfect. Funny and you I, should mention that. Yeah? It's been that way since the moment I sat down to play with him for the first time. Really? Yes. There was, there's something incredible about our musical connection that transcends any time or, or who we are or where we are. Or At the time that I met him, I'm not sure if he was still on drugs or not. I mean, he I think he was. But when we sat down to play, it was just like we were one instrument. And we were just jamming, but I knew where he would be and he was there. He knew where I would be. It was... Remarkable, and that has remained true every second of our musical life from then until the last time we played together was Jane Fonda's 80th birthday, but if we played together tomorrow, after not seeing each other for, you know, this happens if we haven't seen each other for years, we sit down and we know exactly where we're supposed to be, assuming, of course, that I know the song of his if, if he's finger picking, you match it perfectly, which are like normal piano pat patterns, but it's just locked in perfectly. Totally, it's beautiful. It's it's a magical, inexplicable thing. But I have to say, my writing with Jerry is a magical, inexplicable thing. You know, the, we're we're so different. You know, but um, you know, Jerry said that you guys wrote many bad songs before you wrote good ones. Is, is well, that well, that's probably true. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. But so you started, I mean, you wrote Will You Love Me Tomorrow at 18, right? So yes. you, you wrote a lot of songs before that? Uh, yeah. Well, some, yeah, quite a few. I mean, there were those $25 songs. How did, how did you guys learn that you could write songs together? By doing it. But what brought you together to write songs? Um, as they depict in the, in the musical... We were at Queens College together, and he was sort of a highbrow. He didn't like rock and roll. He thought rock and roll was beneath him. <laughs> he liked jazz. He liked Broadway music. He liked classical music. And he was really highbrow about it. I mean, Jerry was an intellectual. And rock and roll at that time was not intellectual, which was the point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But uh, I was writing rock and roll before I met Jerry because that's all I had been exposed to that I thought was possible for me. I was listening to Alan Freed and, you know, all these songs that he would play and they were accessible. I, was, I could write that. I could do that. And they were for teenagers. And I lived in New York City. So before I met Jerry, I was going around to publishers. I met Jerry Wexler and Ahmed Erdogan before I met Jerry. I mean, mm. I was going in and they, they thought I was talented, but, you know, I, I needed better lyrics because I think the example of my lyrics was baby, 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 sitting on my baby, 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 sitting on my. <laughs> so I and needed you, help. So you go in and sing live and perform for them? Yes, that was the only way you do it. And they, in those days, they were still taking kids in off the street. Don Costa was a mentor of mine. He signed me to a deal, and that was one of the records I did for him, Babysitting. Another one is, I know I am the right girl, the right girl for you, uh, 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 and you uh, uh, are the right boy for me, too. I needed help. <laughs> <laughs> and God sent me Jerry Goffin. <laughs> so we met in Queens College, and um, he wanted me to write lyrics for this story that he had written as a Broadway show script. But he didn't, he needed music. He had lyrics and everything. Oh. And I said, okay, but I want you to write for my rock and roll songs. And it's like, okay, you know. And which brought the money first is, <laughs> you know, the rock and roll songs. And yeah. that's at that point, you know, I was pregnant. We were married. We 
he had a family to provide for, and that's what drove him was, you know, the one that brought in the money. Also, making a Broadway show was a very complicated thing. These were three-minute songs. They could be recorded in an hour in a demo studio mm -hmm. on Broadway. <laughs> so he was attracted very much by that. So and, and you said he didn't like rock and roll. Did he change his feeling about rock and roll? Um, while writing, while you guys wrote? No, he changed rock and roll, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing. He was, you know, it's interesting because we talked to Mike Stoller, who was also a hybrid, also yeah. into jazz, jazz guy, also yeah. didn't like rock and roll. Right. You know, and they did the same thing. They changed rock and roll and they incorporated R&B and classical music. I, I heard your interview with Mike Stoller blew me away because I, as much as I know those guys so well, and I didn't know half of what he was telling you, it was wonderful. So the thing is that Jerry and I in our little ground floor apartment with you in the next room, you know, would be thinking, oh God, listen to that. There goes my baby. Oh my God, we got to do that. Listen to that timpani. <laughs> Boom, boom, da 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 So there's R&B, there's classical, and it was everything that we wanted to be. And that's what uh, moved, you know, moved us to do Will You Love Me Tomorrow. I mean, it was just the song with me playing it, but then the Broadway musical is telling the truth, and I really did get a book on how to orchestrate the strings. Mm. But, um, you know, that was Jerry's concept. Let's take this very simple song and put strings into it. So, jump, 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 bump, tonight you're mine. And we incorporated what we heard, but Lieber and Stoller did that. What was fascinating about talking to Mike Stoller, which I didn't know, is is that they, they became producers mm -hmm. to protect their songs, to protect their songs from being done in a really, you know, weak, yeah. weak way. They yeah. wanted the big timpanis and the drums, and they wanted everything to have an edge. And, and so they said that they were writing records at one point. They were not just writing songs, writing records. Were you ever writing records? Um, no. No. You're writing songs. Back then, I and I think always, I think I have always just written songs. But when mm -hmm. you get in the studio with a band, it, it gets bigger. But I have been lucky in having, um, with, with Lou Adler, the producer, who said, my goal, and he, you did an interview with him, he said then, and I knew that he said this and had this attitude, my goal is to protect Carol and the song and keep them central. Mm -hmm. And I understood that and, and knew that he was doing that. And that's what Lieber and Stoller, in a way, might have been doing. Except when you say they wrote records, it's quite possible that as producers, they heard the possibilities, but they still always had a great song. Mm -hmm. for, me, it was, for me, it's always just... Well, it's the song. And I have written on guitar a few times. I'm not really fluent on guitar. I know a few chords, and within the range of those chords, I have written on guitar, and it's similar, but my native instrument is piano. And when I do that, I am channeling something. And in fact, even recently, uh, I haven't written for, for many years, and in part because I feel like I don't have anything new to say, and in part because it's a different market, my time, I mean, you know, the songs I've written are many, and they, they're out there. Thank you, God. Thank you, audiences. There's standards. Many standards. Again, I just wrote songs, you know. But that is the ultimate achievement for a songwriter. But, but, one standard is pretty great. You know? It is. <laughs> it is, and I, I just, I feel blessed because all I did is, was what any songwriter does, and that is write a song, but my songs happen to connect with people at a particular time, in a particular way, and then again, later in, in my incarnation as a performing artist or yeah. recording artist, Again, and that I think had something to do with the Vietnam War because people were, I didn't know this, of course, I was just writing what I was and who I am, but uh, at, during the Vietnam War and the politics and everything was crazy making, people were starving for something real. And I wasn't the first or the only, but that singer-songwriter thing coalesced 
yeah. as a response <clears throat> to all the craziness. So that, again, to me, that's like right place at the right time. I'm just a songwriter. I write songs. That's what I do. But I was going to say that I hadn't, I haven't written any new songs for quite a while. But the songwriting instinct kicked in recently because with things going on in the world, I was thinking about, sometimes I think about injustice and things that are happening that are bad, you know. I think about things like Jerry used to. And I had this impulse to go back and record an old song that I had written in 1977 when I was first living in Idaho. Mm -hmm. It was just a true song, the very essence of who I am. It's called One, and it's poetic Poetic phrases come to mind whenever I find injustice being done. And I wonder, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What can one do except be one, talking to two, touching three, growing to four million? Each of us is one. All of us are one. If anything embodies my whole belief and philosophy about life and what every one of us matters, even when we think we don't, and even when it appears we don't, we must keep going and be that one that we are. So I was moved to rewrite it for the events of 2018. Yeah, it's a beautiful song. We needed hopeful songs. And I sat great. down to write a new last verse because some of the lyrics were no longer, you know, relevant to me. And the songwriter Gene, boom! <laughs> Right there. <laughs> of course. Boom. <laughs> Getting back on the bicycle. Exactly. But it was it was fun. And it was, because there was a reason, I felt there was a reason. And I did have something new and relevant to say, even if it was the same old thing, <laughs> rewritten. And so, yeah, it's, it's a thing. It uh, is relevant. It's a gift. And I'm grateful to have it and to be the instrument for it. It's still relevant, and what you described during the Vietnam War is is a good description of where things are today. I mean, people do want real. The fact that people, what they want is real people behind the scenes, real stories. They want real. And real think, songs, too. They, they like a real song. I think people want all of it. People go to see spectacle. They go, they watch all this stuff, and they enjoy it. They watch, they binge watch on Netflix. I mean, people want all of it. But there is a place for the real, the authentic, the connection. One of my greatest uh, joys uh, in recent years was John Legend had a number one song with John Legend and a piano, All mm. of Me. And yeah. I was like, oh, thank God they can still do that. Yeah, I feel the same way. <laughs> I interviewed Bruno Mars and he said that he wrote a song old school on a piano. You know, to them, that's old school to use an instrument as opposed to, you know, brass, you know? And, but that's really where the, the great songs came from. I mean, your songs, they're, they're as great as ever. They're solid because they're real songs. It makes me, a difference. Let me play devil's advocate. Louise's mm -hmm. son, Hayden, is a, a, a musician, a writer, a, a producer, and he's, you know, he is creating these, um, he's a musician, he knows music, he can sit down and play piano in a way that will blow you away, oh my God, what a great piano player. And at the same time, he, he takes all these sounds and he makes them mechanically and, you know, you mm -hmm. go to the programs and whatever it is, and I recognize that those are just other instruments. Yes. So, yes. and he does these wonderful sounds that are like, I've never heard anything quite like yeah. it, but they are so moving and so emotional. And I, I often hear great pop records or really interesting records, but they're not really great songs necessarily, but they're really great records. And I'm not talking about his music, but I was listening to, you know, some of yours and thinking about what Lou Adler said, you know, he, he takes no credit for tapestry. He said, you know, Carol, it's all in the songs. It was perfectly arranged. All I had to do was not, you know, not get in, get the, in way. the way. Yeah. But, but I, can I say that is so valuable because at that stage in my career, I could not have produced myself. Jerry wasn't there to produce me. And if he had been, I mean, he was, he was there, but not in my life at the time. Um, had he done that, Jerry's vision was brilliant. I mean, Porpoise Song is not, I wrote the music to that, but Jerry had that vision he knew what that thing was supposed to be. Lou had the vision to know that there was value in in this little kernel 
of Carol on the piano, which he protected. And, you know, who's to say? Well, here's an example, and Peter Asher will be the first to say this, that James's first album, James Taylor's first album on Apple, which Peter produced, was way mm -hmm. overproduced. Mm -hmm. And the second album, Peter had the wisdom to do exactly what Lou did with ah, me. Yeah. Sweet Baby James is the kernel of James and guitar and a mm -hmm. great song. You're right, it's essentially right. Yeah, and so the band, Russ Kunkel, is just, as he always is, Russ wants to know the lyric. He always asks for a copy of the lyric. Really? And when he's playing drums, he's got that lyric, and he keeps that pocket that Russ Kunkel, I won't, won't say he invented, but he certainly made famous, and may have invented, um, but he never gets in the way. And the same about Lee, you know, Lee Sklar on bass, and that was James's core band, and for a while I was part of the core band as piano, but I am, you know, on piano, I'm sort of like an extension of James. I'm doing what James would do if he could play piano. But it fits in there so perfectly. So that's yeah. the kernel that Lou protected. Yeah, but it also has to do with the songwriting and that the songs were so well constructed. I was just listening to today some of it and I realized you take the band out, the song is still perfect, you know, just piano voice, which you don't always get. To me, that's a real song, you know. A lot of these songs today, I wonder, you can't really sit in a bar years from now and hear that on a Piano, can you? You know, some of these songs, they're, it's impossible. Can but. I tell you of, I just, I mean, this is, she's out there, been out there already, but I recently discovered on my own, before Saturday Night Live, an artist called Ella May. She's great. She's awesome. Besides being beautiful, <laughs> and besides, I watched, I watched her perform, and I can see Gaga has the same thing. Gaga lets the music flow through her. Every time I have seen her perform, even when she does all these production numbers, she knows she, that's flowing through her too. Mm -hmm. She likes fashion. She likes the meat dress. Yeah. You know? but, and that's an expression of who she is too. Yeah. But there's always a great song. And yeah, she's a real songwriter. Yeah. She's a real songwriter. Yeah. And one of the the great moments of my seeing her was at a tribute that Music Harris did where Gaga performed You've Got a Friend and all I saw was wow. the back of her which was she was wearing a white dress with little or no back and all I saw was the back of her and I watched the song flow through her in the way that I could tell she was she just sat there and let the song happen to her Really moving. I saw the same thing in LMA's performance mm. as she moved. She wasn't moving for the camera. There was just not, that was not happening. She was just letting the music roll through her. And she is a writer on the song. There are other writers, credit to all of them. Because mm -hmm. the songs have music, they're melodic, there's structure, there's a message. And it's contemporary. I could not do any of that today. And the execution, I she does melisma, but I think people do overdo melisma. Mm -hmm. For those who don't know what melisma is, it's giving many syllables to one word. So you go, me, me, yeah. and as you can see, I cannot do it. She does it, but she does it exactly where needed and no more. So I heard a live with you and James and Will You Love Me Tomorrow? And you did a little at the end. You did a variation on the, the last verse, and it was, it was great. Well, if I did, someone else was playing me because no, I tried to master No, that was you. It was a great performance. It was just the two of you. It was great. I loved it. Oh, yeah. He's, but, he's, he's fun. He's just fun. When we're on stage, it's just fun. And we're not on tour anymore because I, I think he wanted to go on forever, but... He's a road dog and I'm not. And, and also, I think when a special thing gets done for too long, it stops being special. I wanted to stop when it was still special. He, he loves performing. He does. Are, are you the same one? Do you, do, you, do you love performing? I love performing now. When I, I, I say now because I used to be scared. James is who ushered me forward and said, sing up on the roof. We were doing a gig of his and he pushed me forward and said, I want you to sing up on I can't. He said, they're going to love you. I'll tell, I'll tell them you wrote it. They're going to love you. And I, I describe in my book in very great detail, line by line, the tentative thing with which I described how it is to write a song. That was the way I felt about performing that. You know, it was up on the roof. Mm -hmm. And I could feel the confidence. I could feel the audience going, 
oh, wow, she wrote that. I love this song. And they were welcoming. You, you read the room, you know, you, you just kind of go, yeah. And by the end of the song, I was confident. And, I, you know, I had that experience again another time. But it it's something now, yes, the answer is, that was a long answer. The short answer is I do love performing when I'm doing it. Um, it's that ability, the best it is, is when you just come out there and now, because I know that I am appreciated, I don't have any fear. I just have fear if my voice is going to work that night. But even when it doesn't, I have had to change melodies when I had laryngitis and I'd be dancing like this and I had three notes. I put, I used those three notes and sang natural woman on those three <laughs> notes and people were so happy that I showed up and tried. So, yes, I, I do enjoy it, but I don't enjoy the road and I don't enjoy the grind of doing it. And I also wanted a sort of, you know, the, the Hyde Park concert was sort of a highlight. It's a good opening act, too. That, that, that. <laughs> yes, yeah. I Thank had you. an excellent opening act who was appreciated by a country in which she lived for 10 years and established herself in that community. So it was awesome for me as her proud mom to watch people, you know, gather around as she was performing. That was an unbelievable day. And yeah. guitar solo, too, that you played, right? <clears throat> that was terrifying, the guitar solo, because this is in the same way that James pushed you out or that you, you know, said, Danny, play a solo, you know, <laughs> on tapestry, and he thought, it wasn't going to be heard all over the world. <laughs> she says to me, you're going to play a solo, and I'm playing with Danny Cooch and you Dylan, know, Dylan Condor, the, you know, these, these, these shredders. Yeah. Play yeah. a solo. And it's like, really, for the first time, I'm going to play a solo in front of all these people? And you held up your end. You you were lead guitar for uh, Tears for Fears. Well, all, all I thought about the entire time in front of all those people was... I've got a guitar solo coming up, and once it was over, I could enjoy being on You stage. nailed it. You played it well, right? Oh, thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so I'll do all the talking. I have to let Louise do it. It's, it's <laughs> okay. Uh, we've talked before. <laughs> and and um, uh, you, you are, this is a conversation. This is exactly what I wanted. To Me yeah, too. So, so what it's I, great. the questions I have, which I have an interest, first of all, I want to say, I didn't ask you to do this interview. No, you didn't. I did not. I mean, I know, and I'm very well trained, that I, I just don't ask you to do things, and I know that you don't like doing interviews, and I would never say, hey, I'm doing this podcast, you know? And people ask me all the time, hey, can how do I get in touch with your mother? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I can give you her manager's phone number, but be prepared. She is probably going to say no, because that's the answer, usually. So... My question, first of all, is why did you want to do this? Because I've, I've begged you at times to do things I thought would be a great idea. <coughs> you have. Just for I've posterity, seen. just for the grandchildren and future generations. They would want to know this. It's, you know, why not spend the two hours talking to this person? It would be great to have. And you're like, I just don't want to do it. So, so why I asked. Yeah. Um, the, the last one of these, first of all, you told me, you know, daughter to mom, you said, hey, I'm doing this, you know, great song adventure podcast with Paul Zolo, and we're going to interview songwriters, and we're, we're, we're doing this and that, and Paul has interviewed, and you have interviewed, there are archival ones that you did, um, and I've been listening to them, I've been catching up, I'm, I'm trying to write a novel now, oh which my. that's all I'll say about this right now, because... A novel is not a three-minute song. It takes a lot longer. But um, so my, that's what I'm doing with most of my time. But when I find time, I listen to the podcast. And I've heard quite a few of them. And I was so impressed by them. And the combination of you and Louise as interviewers is wonderful because it is a conversation, yeah. which is key always to me to have a conversation. I can translate that to music, too, because... When I play with a band, we're having a conversation. Yeah. The band and me. We're having a conversation in my song, and I may be the sort of spotlight attention, but we're all having a conversation and the messages to, hey, let's get this song out there. Okay, now you speak. Now you speak, and everybody knows when it's their turn. Mm -hmm. Back to your podcast. I have been so impressed with the historical record 
that you're making. I listened to Mike Stoller's interview, and as I said, I've known Mike for years. I was he, I was heavily influenced by him, mm. and just hearing all that, there was so much I didn't know. I mean, his whole thing with the movies and Elvis and yeah. a lot of stuff, and you know, and their beginnings with you know Big Mama Thornton and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I heard your two-parter with Chrissy, which was before Louise, right? Yeah, this was an archive. An archive. Yeah. And you captured, or Chrissy allowed you to capture, which is key. She trusted you. Mm -hmm. And Chrissy is not one who trusts easily, and she is not one who suffers fools. Very true. At all. Right. And she considered you not a fool, and she spoke... Uh, frankly and so honestly, and I learned so much about her because I, I, I know that she has been influenced by people of my generation. Um, I think m me being a, a composer on piano, I don't know, you know, if the, it's a correlation. The people she referred to were more guitar players and rockers. Right, right on, Chrissy. <laughs> but I loved her passion and and I just felt so informed. I love her music. I love the Pretenders. I mm. love that she's never been Chrissy Hine. She's the Pretenders. Yeah, That's cool. what I wanted to be when I first started out. The Band. city, you yeah, know. Yeah. But um, she's she's just an awesome human being. I love her passion about animals. And some people say, "Get out of my face with this." Well, yeah, I know, I know, I know you. You love animals and you don't want anything wrong done to them. That's right. She does, and she doesn't want anything right. bad done to them. Yeah. But I loved how you elicited all that from her and oh, her attitude. You. And she was a little fearful at times and shy and then out, out front balls to the wall. Mm -hmm. It was, I, I loved that. And that is, yeah. you're building a historical archive. You know, the oral histories. Mm -hmm. This is so important, and that's why I thought, you know what, I really should be a part of this because I am well-known, I am an elder in the songwriting community, and that's why I did it. It had nothing to do with Louise being my daughter, although what I also love about hearing Louise is that she has been part of these people's lives. She knew Chrissy in London. They were yes. friends. They'd hang out, you know? And and when she interviewed Mike, I'm talking about you in third person. <laughs> I'm sitting here. When you interviewed Mike Stoller and you spoke as the child who had heard that music, you know, and growing up and what that meant to you, I thought, what a great perspective for someone to have who's been, you know, who's who's been involved first as a child and then as an adult and then you are much more a part of the songwriting community wherever you live than I am. I, I was for a while, I guess, when I did The Castle. You spoke about The Castle, Miles. Yeah, I mean, I've done a lot of traveling, and um, my community has always been musicians and songwriters. That's been my extended family, and it, it's a lovely thing. It's a lovely thing to be able to travel and feel like there's family and there's this common thread. And this is the thing I love about music more than anything. It's I can't think of another area of work where you get such a diversity of backgrounds, you know, even the way people are raised with church or whatever their religious beliefs were, where you come together to play, to perform, to write, where you're, you're just all in this common zone mm. of artists together and all of that goes away yeah and and i and i love that and it's made me just grow as a human being to be able to have such a diversity of backgrounds in the community i've been in my whole life yeah that's it's, it's a beautiful she turned out well so you're a good mom too you did a good job parenting <laughs> as well I and she's a good mom I as well. Didn't do I didn't do it. She raised herself <laughs> by wolves. She was raised by wolves. Worked out pretty well. I want to ask you some questions. Do you? My yeah. turn, because this is a conversation. Because um, I have 7,000 more questions for you. I know. <laughs> I know. I only have like three. But so I want to know more about you. About You are a songwriter, you, and, and I want to know what your take is in general on, you know, what it's like for you to write a song, and how do you write? Do you write on you write on guitar? You said right. I start on guitar. I write piano songs too. I'm not a great piano player, but 
I think I play piano, and I find even piano songs come out so differently than the guitar songs. Yeah. It's... And there's, to this day, there's nothing I love more than writing songs. That all the writing, you know, about songwriting was just to make a living. But also, I have general reverence for, for someone that's written a song that the whole world knows. To me, there's nothing greater or more exciting. It, it, like I said, if you just had one of those, that's really huge. Are you, know, you, since, are you still writing? Oh, yeah, I'm always writing songs. Even and... when I have deadlines, I'm like, oh, I could take a half hour and work on the song, and three hours go by. And, but, yeah, I, I write, and I, I collaborate a lot, and I record, and... I'd, I'd like to do only that. But this is this is great. But I, I really share your feelings about the historical record because to me it really matters. And let's face it, these songs that you wrote, they're not forgotten. They're a part of our lives. They're the standards. Like I said, you go in, you know, the, the grocery store. We used to hear, you know, Rodgers and Hammerstein. You know, now we hear your songs or James, which I like, you know. They're, and those songs last. And to me, you know, those are real songs, great melodies, great lyrics. That to me it matters more than anything. So, so I love the chance to get to, you know, find out how it happened, how you made it work and all that. Well, that, and, and I think the fact that the people that you you interview, their works have become famous and well-known, and that gives it sort of place. But as a songwriter, do you ever feel like, okay, I just wrote this song. I don't care what happens to it. I just did this. Mm. Don't you have that pride of, oh, yeah. like, wow, there was a nothing and now there's a something. All the time. Nothing's more exciting. Yeah. And so. I've never been tied into, well, is it going to get, you know, on a, is it going to be recorded? None of that really matters. It's, just, it's another good song. And that's, and that's cool, I think. That, that's cool that you can feel that because not everybody gets to have Chrissy Hines' success or Chrissy right, right. success. Or... But at the same time, I see a lot of people that want to write songs, but they didn't do what you and Jerry did, like, right, you know, a lot about it, just keep writing for years and become great songwriters and develop artistry. And to me, that's an important lesson that it takes a long time to learn how to write songs. They're short, so people might think they're simple, but it's not easy to write a great song. No, I mean, in three minutes, you have to say something or move people. I was hearing like, your early rock songs. I listened to Don't Bring Me Down today, the Animals version, yeah, which Tom Petty also did. But that, that's such a great song. It's like, it was pretty hard rock right from the beginning, too. Yeah, that's another, if you listen to that lyric, that might have been addressed to me. Oh, is that right? I mean, I think so, but... Barry Goldberg once told me that every lyric Dad ever wrote was about you. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an example. Saving all my love for you? Uh, uh, yeah, he, that's what he said. He said every, every, it's not the spotlight, he said, was about you. Hmm. Interesting. You know, you said to me, you know, our songs, even when we were writing rock and roll, they were more sophisticated than rock and roll. He, he made a real point of that, you know, especially your music. He said, Carol was really an amazing musician. So I was noticing that, like, a Don't Bring Me Down, uh, you know, it's like, I believe in C, but it goes down to B flat. It doesn't just go one, four, five. It's a, right away. It goes to an interesting change. I, I don't remember that process <laughs> at all. It just came out that way. Don't Bring Me Down. I love that song. And I, Tom Petty did it, as you said, and Chrissy mm -hmm. Hine also did a version of it. Yeah, it was featured on our great song, Adventure. And a, a great song in that original record. It's, oh, it's no. raw. It's got a raw energy to it. Yeah, it's it's a rock song. Yeah. It's an attitude song. But uh, like all of their songs, even the, the rock and roll, they were always there's something different musically. That's what I was trying to get to. Your mom's not the kind of, you know, to blow her own horn too much, but her chords were always interesting. And it's a great education for songwriters to play her songs on the piano. I've tried it. You learn a lot by playing her songs. Yeah, and she says that even on that song that she wasn't trying to write for a band. She said that she was just going by what the lyric was that my dad gave her mm -hmm. and that maybe he had written it into the song. So she felt like his interpreter a lot. Mm -hmm. It was great to hear about the monkeys because... You know, my dad, and it's depicted in the musical, he was like, the monkeys, now we're writing for a pretend band. But, you know, as time goes on, the monkeys really hold up as mm -hmm. having some great stuff. And as my mother pointed out, there there were real musicians in that band. Oh, yeah, real musicians. And uh, they got really great songwriters. I mean, the monkeys were great singers. You know, Davey and Mickey and Mike, they were all great singers. And Pete. But they got great songwriters, too. They did, you know, Boyce and Hart, of course, and Neil Diamond wrote I'm a Believer, and your parents wrote Pleasant Valley Sunday. Yeah. And your, I didn't realize, I mean, your mom said that was real, too. I mean, they didn't just contrive any of these songs. She said that was about your, your suburban life in New Jersey. 
inspired by that. Yeah, well, there was a Pleasant Valley Way on, that was one of the roads, Pleasant Valley Way, when you drove into our neighborhood in West Orange. Hmm. In fact, uh, I have very, very clear memories of when we first moved to L.A., going to the Screen Gems building and the IHOP. And you she saw would, Davy Jones, right? Well, yeah, that was huge, of course. <laughs> of course. That was a beyond rock star moment for any year old. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And, you know, the impact of the monkeys can't be denied now because they have a, a very energized and uh, dedicated fan base. It's huge. And I know many people, and any, if I mention your mother's name or your dad's name, they go, did you talk about Pleasant Valley Sunday? That's all they want to know is just about that song and anything having to do with monkeys. Yeah. One of the things I've been learning about doing these podcast episodes with you, Paul, is that a lot of the songs that we revere so much today, when people were writing them, they weren't writing them for posterity. They weren't writing them for any reason other than they wanted what they wanted in that moment, mm -hmm. either to get that cut or get on that show or impress their friends. And nobody dreamed that any of the work that they did would be thought about, remembered, or taken seriously 50 years later. And it really is a good lesson to all songwriters who may feel insignificant in the moment. You really don't know what something means. Mm -hmm. And it's not our job. And Martha Graham you know, had had that famous quote is that we make the work, but it's not our job at that point afterwards to decide what its merit is. Mm. And I think we all fall prey to thinking, am I worthy? Is this important enough? Is it being recognized enough? Those questions really don't come into the stage of creating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your mom exemplifies that. And it was just about writing a great song always. And and that's what it was about. And that's why those songs last. And they were real songs. I mean, your mom's songs were so well constructed and the way your dad wrote lyrics that those songs hold up. Like we were saying in the interview, you can sit down at a piano and play that song and the whole thing is there. It's written into the song. And uh, I think that's another reason they last. But there's no question about it. You know, with Mike Stoller too, a song like Hound Dog, they didn't consider it anything, you know, that special, that it would last forever. They didn't have a clue. They didn't think rock and roll would even last. They were raised, as, as we were saying, on Rodgers and Hammerstein and those kind of songs. They, they didn't consider their songs would become standards, but they certainly did. Their songs are standards. It's a great lesson. It is. A lot of good lessons in our shows. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure being here, and we get to do this again next week because we have actually our longest episode with my mother. She talked extensively. I've never heard her talk so openly and so deeply about my father and the relationship between them mm -hmm. as songwriters and what it was like to live with him and write with him. Yeah, she really and, opened up. Yes, she tell, told stories about the locomotion and, and a lot of the songs that they wrote and where they were when they wrote them and the circumstances. And I've never heard so much detail about that. So, you know, the next episode's a long one and a juicy one. So tune in with us next week. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you next time.